Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And classic 2020. I've started the session still muted. Welcome everyone. Can you hear me now? Fantastic. Uh, my name is Pat Nurse, or as I like to say in Zoom speak, good afternoon and thank you for joining us in this latest in Melbourne Food and Wine Festival's series of industry forums. My name is Pat Nurse, as I said, and I'm the creative director of the festival. Uh, the focus of today's forum is bars, which is a subject uh, close to, to my heart and I imagine to yours as well. Um, it's safe to say, I think that 2020 has been the most challenging year for hospitality and living memory. And while the business has suffered across the board, I think it's also fair to say that the bars have been hit particularly hard. Um, and while there's a lot of great cities with a lot of great bars, Melbourne is exceptional both in the calibre of its bars and in the central role that those bars play in making Melbourne, Melbourne. They're central here to our night economy. Uh, they're central to our urban culture. And for many of us, they're central to our lives. Without our bars, what's the point of staying up late? It's just not that interesting. Um, you know, and laneways just end up being places that you keep your rubbish. We're robbed pretty much of a place in society where we can meet and talk and dream and laugh and love. Sounds a little bit like a bumper sticker or possibly an inspiring uh, Instagram quotation, but it's a real thing. You know, it's, it's a space where we can be different, where we can meet people we don't know. We can try out different personas and, and live, uh, bigger, shall we say. What's the point of being local, after all, if you don't have a local? Joining me today to discuss this and more is a group of people with a wealth of experience uh, regarding this question. Tash Conti is the founder of Black Pearl, the, the Brunswick Street landmark that has been a mainstay of all the world's best bars lists for as long as these lists have existed. Uh, and the bar has just celebrated its 18th year in business. Welcome, Tash. Thank you. Welcome, Pat. Welcome, everyone. Um, Zara Madrissen is the co-founder of the Made in the Shade group, which encompasses the Everly in Fitzroy, Lonsdale Street favourites, Heartbreaker and Bar Margot, uh, and a wealth of other hospitality excitement. Zara, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi. And the third member of our panel today is Michael Beschetta. Michael is the co-founder of Bar Liberty in Fitzroy uh, and of Capitano in Carlton, and he's also the CEO of the hospitality community and co-working co -working space, Worksmith. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Pat. Um, Michael, I'd like to start with you, if I may. Um, the subject of this, uh, the, the title of this conversation is Saving the Bars of Melbourne. What are we, what are we actually looking to save? You know, what are we, what are we going to return to if, if and when we recover? It's an interesting one. I we've obviously had a prolonged closure and a lot of uh, I guess uh, hustle to to stay alive um, throughout this time. Whilst uh, I guess understanding what our businesses were to begin with, I think a lot of us have taken that time to look to the future as to to what you know the future of Melbourne bars are and our own venues. And I think for me, it's creating. A, a space, as you say before, you're local and having that connection to community and how important that is. Because we saw when we did go into lockdown and, and this prolonged closure that we relied on that community more than anything throughout that time to uh, keep us alive in, in some way. And I think that's really important going forward, ensuring that we're continuing that connection uh, to place. What does that mean in practical terms? Like those are nice sentiments and I've, <laughs> I've heard similar things said by other venues and other operators saying that, you know, you really know who your friends are when you look at who's actually patronizing your businesses when things are tough like that. What does maintaining that connection mean for you in practical terms as a bar owner? Uh, I think for me, it's a uh, continual connection with those people that come through your venue again and again, whether it's for their birthday celebratory occasion or for a, a midweek knockoff drink is that we're ensuring that we're connecting with them um, during that time when we are open and then through this time giving them something that uh, gives them the connection back to the bar as to why they loved it so much and it, it was a bit of an overwhelming response and you know Tash and Zara I'm sure will 
say the same in terms of the support in, in the early days of shutdown that people really wanted to have us around. They really wanted us to survive. And that is it's obviously quite heartwarming. And uh, we want to ensure that we continue those relationships going forward. And that's by providing them with great product, whether it's in their home or in our bars when they can actually uh, get a seat. Mm. And I mean, your, your businesses are relatively new or Capitano is, is the newest of your drinks businesses. You've got Falco bakery as well, but that's sort of a concern, a concern outside the question of our conversation today. Mm. If you were opening Capitano this side of COVID-19, is there much that you would have done differently? Yeah, I, I think it would be more around would would the size would the space be the same size? Would we do uh, reduce seating to double down on takeaway uh, leases? Uh, you know, albeit you know, hopefully for most people, somewhat on pause right now. Um, that they're expensive and they're not going to go down. So that continual increase in rent year on year uh, will that match revenue increase? And can we continue to afford to, to pay it? I think having uh, keeping that in mind and understanding this huge shift towards eating and drinking at home, uh, and that will continue coming out of COVID as well, is that where are we spending our money where it's most profitable at coming out the other end? So how can we be present in people's homes as well as when they come, uh, come to the, the venue as well? Who's dinging? Stop dinging, whichever, whichever of you is dinging. It's not me. Um, the ding is quite a good segue, though, to, to switch between speakers. I mean, uh, Tash Conti, recovery is all very well, but we've got some fraught, uh, I want to say weeks, but, you know, it may be even in the months before bars are anywhere near um, having people back in venue. Is enough being done to keep the bars of Melbourne afloat in the meantime? Um, I personally don't think so. Uh, you know, you speak to anybody, um, there's, there's always going to be, if not two sides, ten sides. But um, the way I see it, I think we're going to be in lockdown for a lot longer than, than uh, is being said. Um, just, you know, just the conditioning of our environments is, you know, people together. And um, so I just, just that premise alone, people cannot relinquish the fact or put that together with what is going on currently and thinking that that environment is, you know, is, is exacerbating it. Um, and it, it may well be and it may well not. Um, but uh, I, I, I cannot see us coming out and being back at our 170 capacity for a long time. What are you doing to prepare for that? Um, so we're just developing, it, it, I, I've never felt uh, like an old dog trying to get new tricks at, at 50. <laughs> um, and it's exhausting. It's exhausting trying to be, uh, you know, ingenuity in, in your own business. You do daily, but not to these extremes. You're literally coming up with um, business models on the fly mm. and think of everything from the ground up and hoping that that's going to be a raging success. Um, you know, for us to equate um, what our losses are weekly, uh, we would have to sell 3,200 single bottled cocktails a week to recoup what we've lost. And the idea, I mean, while, while it's fantastic that, you know, um, you guys have been able to sell takeaway cocktails and, you know, the takeout's been good. Zara, you know, you, you guys have spearheaded the... Um, Melbourne mixtape, you know, getting a whole bunch of Melbourne bars together in, in one packaged range. Tash, it's, it's, you know, it's a small amount of revenue compared to what, what you're missing. Yeah, totally. Um, I and mean, we're grateful for the mixtape. The mixtape is obviously, you know, it's allowed us to, to jump in, you know, other people's pools of um, uh, uh, followers or, you know, all the rest and, and consumers, obviously. So that's been, that's been a massive, massive help because, I mean, I'm not sure about the other companies, but for us, we don't have, I don't have um, funding or we've never invested um, in, in like advertising or anything like that. It's literally an old school business, word of mouth. But, you know, today, this platform that we're in currently is, the, is polar opposite to how we generally trade. Uh, you really do have to have a, a very big and visible footprint 
um, uh, on Instagram and Facebook and, and any other platform that's allowing you to be able to sell your products to, to get out to the masses to recoup something. I mean, it is, it is yeah, I guess getting out and waving the flag is in many ways ant antithetical. Is that a real word? Did I just make that up? <laughs> to, um, you know, the ways that Melbourne bars traditionally market themselves. Melbourne bars traditionally market themselves by finding the an alley off a laneway, off an alley off a laneway and having an unmarked door with a broken light bulb out the front. And exactly, I guess in 2020, whether it's doing that physically or online, it's not maybe priming your business for success. No, totally. Exactly. It's um, like I said, it's a, it's a completely different platform for us, especially. I mean, Zara there, you know, they, you can see it yourself. Like you have to put in so much more energy for not much gain. And sometimes you question whether it's worth it, but you need to be able to still be visible or else coming out the other side. I think the, the hill is just going to be too high to climb. So uh, you try and do the best that you can uh, without sacrificing, you know, your brand or your product. And um, I'm not going to say hope for the best, but it sort of feels like that a little bit. Tash, I mean, in terms of assistance coming from the government or, you know, brands or things like that, what's going to really make the difference? You know, what's good, if, if you're a bar owner in Melbourne, and I say Melbourne because, of course, there are bars in regions and they're facing these challenges as well. But, you know, Melbourne is under a longer lockdown. Um, what's, yeah, what, what are the things that, what are the initiatives in place or initiatives you'd like to see that will really make the difference between people keeping the lights on or, or being able to reopen at the end of the year or the end of next month or in 2021 and, and, and not, you know? For me, I think that it's uh, it, it's pretty much not far off for for what I how I practice daily is is that you want your best price off your invoice because that's affecting primary that's straight out of your cash flow and second of all cash money uh, to be able to pay pay bills pay outstanding bills pay bills that are accruing um, be able to keep the staff. Uh, rather than just depending and letting them work for the job keeper amount. It, it can do so much. And I think, um, you know, if, if somebody asked me, you know, for, our, for this outdoor conversation that's currently on, you know, we can only have 16 people outside. That, you know, I mean, even if somebody from the government turned around and said, you've got 50 grand to spend outside, I can't do much with, you know, for 16 people, I'm going to be investing that sort of, you know, umbrellas and whatever, new barriers. And they're all things that I can get from brands that I don't have to pay for. So, you know, I would rather someone say, okay, this is, this is an amount we can give you. And you can inject that in any which way without any strings attached to your business to physically get you out of those moles, those molehills that are, uh, you know, they're just creeping up and there's more and more. The more you look, we have a, a literally a, uh, a timeline where we've got all of our invoices and it's the first time in 18 years that we're paying invoices, you know, part payments. I've never had to do that in 18 years. Mm. It, um, so for me, it's, uh, I know that would be, it would be amazing and I'd be able to be able to retain staff and pay them the full salary as opposed to keeping them just on the job hours of, you know, 15 hours a week. Um, you know, and they're going to go off and find somewhere else that is paying that, like some of the alcohol companies. Are, there's a lot of advertising going on for new positions and undoubtedly we'll be bit by that. I will lose someone to that. So, you know, because they can. And, I mean, we've, a commenter has just um, uh, jumped in here. And, by the way, if you're in the audience, please do hop on the, the chat button down there if you have a question for any of our panellists or if you'd like to join in with a point. Uh, this commenter has, has just reminded us all that the startup costs are going to sting, you know, when we do get our doors open again. Um, you know, a lot of suppliers are going to be expecting COD. You know, the delivery environment's going to be very different. The, the situation is not, you know, it's, uh, the, the phrase I think you hear people saying is we're not, we're not going to be hopping into a, a time machine and reopening in, you know, December 2019. Zara Madrison, what are your what are your expectations in terms of opening? What do you what do you think it's going to be like when you guys ease back in? And I mean, 
have you and Michael done much modeling in terms of how it's going to work? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's been, it's been such a roller coaster since March, right? We've, you know, first reopen and the modeling done for that and our expectations around that. Um, obviously with no expectation of having to shut it all down again. So it was sort of, let's map this out quite clearly and, you know, providing things go well, we'll obviously leave some things open to learn as we go. Providing things go well, we'll stick with this model for a while um, and, and kind of um, ease back into what might be something more closely resembling our classic business model when, when things are ready. Um, I feel like by this point, we're... Um, so far away from uh, that classic business model. Um, and I don't know when we will return to, um, or if we will return to that classic business model um, at all. Um, and there's some positives and negatives, I guess, around that, like the, the learnings, um, as I think kind of Michael started to indicate, um, we, we need to be able to grow and, and learn and see what we can of this as an opportunity to, to reflect on what the businesses weren't doing perfectly before and how we can cater to a new environment and a new consumer. Um, but um, the challenges and the, and the, um, the uh, steep um, uphill battle that we're, that we're kind of facing is, is really overwhelming. Um, with, I guess, three very different Venues, um, the map is, is quite different. Um, the most challenging, all three have no access to an outdoor space. Um, so this whole uh, outdoor dining and drinking initiative, as much as I, um, I am inspired and would love to see how we could um, get creative and, and perhaps find an alternative space to adopt or, um, or even lease. I don't know how. Um, I, I love the idea of being able to have an opportunity to serve customers um, in, a, in a more expansive space. Um, we don't have anything on our doorstep that would um, allow us to do that at all. So that's, so that's pretty scary. Um, so, um, you know, I think for us at the moment, uh, it would be thinking about the alternative revenue streams that we've already um, had to utilize and look to, I think will be a core part of the business model for a long time. Um, and that's not to say that we necessarily want them to be. I think, um, I think most bar owners and restaurateurs would, would really like to just get back to the core of what they do. Um, and, and that's perhaps what got them into it and what they're passionate about and what they love. Um, this whole kind of pivoting and, and adapting um, might sound kind of very current and, and, um, and exciting, but I don't think for most of us it is um, in this industry. Saying that, um, I think it's really necessary. And I don't think there's one tick box answer of, of um, what's going to save hospitality on the back of COVID. Um, for us, it looks like continuing to create packaged goods, continuing to do delivery models across the board, um, doing virtual classes, um, virtual events, perhaps catering in people's homes when they're allowed to um, have people at home. We are also just trying to, I mean, we sit down with our accounts team once a week and the question is, what else? What else can you do? How else are we paying the rent this week? Um, and, and it is exhausting as, as Tash says, but um, I think that's gonna have to be We've got to somehow stomach up the energy um, and, and have that approach in order to maintain, um, in, in order to survive, but in order to be resilient for, for the months to come. Mm. Michael Bichetta, you know, I mean, uh, Zara has described the things that, you know, a, a smart, uh, energetic business is doing to position itself for survival. To look at things on the other side of the coin, what would... What would describe a business you don't think is going to make it through to 2021? You know, what would be, what would be some of the, the red flags you'd say for a bar that you don't think is going to make it? Uh, I think thinking back pre COVID and we already knew there was plenty of issues in the industry. Uh, and we, I think a lot of people were, were predicting some sort of correction in hospitality. Um, but uh, I guess COVID will be a bit of an overcorrection of that. And we're already starting to see the, the closure of the bars that perhaps would have closed anyway, unfortunately. Um, the, the ones that we will see, I guess, continue to close throughout this time. And then I guess the cliff that will be the end of JobKeeper, unfortunately, at the end of March, is that 
uh, the bars that, uh, as Zara has said, you know, whilst pivoting and, and doing the rest is not uh, joyous, uh, it is necessary right now. And those that weren't able to do it quickly enough or have the market reach uh, won't be able to survive this current period, but then also the start of you know, reopening um, because they don't have that diversified business model going forward. Um, and I really worry for them, like the, you know, having obviously Zara and Tash uh, on this panel and the reach that uh, these bars have uh, is, is incredible. And they've, they've all worked incredibly hard to obtain these over the years. Uh, it's the newer bars that don't, don't have that following yet, or they're just starting to develop a, uh, that community that we touched on earlier that uh, then found it very, would have found very hard to, to change up their business model because they don't really sit into a, a large community or a, a market capture. And, and they're the ones that I really feel for coming through this because they don't have that, that basis to, to jump from. Do you think they can do anything while they're locked down? Like if you're, if you're a bar that is looking to get active, maybe you're new, maybe you've been slow off the mark, maybe you've just been like, look, and we're in the middle of a global health crisis. Not everyone has been up to the, the challenge straight away. Like it's, it's been hard for a lot of people. Say you've, you know, been in a hole and haven't managed to, to mix the metaphor, get your ducks in a row. Say you're coming late to the game. What can you do now? What can you do to, to prime the pump or to start building that community while we're still on lockdown? Uh, I think it's changing up your thinking about what you originally wanted to do. And I think that's perhaps the, I hate using the word, but the silver lining of perhaps a new business coming into this is that you don't have any, or you potentially don't have any preconceived ideas about what your brand is yet. So you can really build that from now as, um, and I, I, not, not exactly bar related, but I've seen other venues that were quite new coming into this that really were struggling to, to gain traction and they actually you know, pivoted quite quickly and have actually gained a lot of ground during COVID because they were able to reach a lot of people. I think, I guess that that's the key for a new operators, um, you know, drumming up that support through uh, whether it's, you know, reaching out to the people in their surrounds directly, um, creating other lines of, of revenue that is a different product that might not be a bottle cocktail like a lot of us are doing, um, just to be known within that household that, that is close by. We've got a, a couple of questions coming in from uh, the people joining us at home or at work. Uh, it's a question here. Maybe I'm oblivious to it. This, this questioner asks, but it seems like landlords aren't being made to feel the pressure as much. They are benefited by being able to rent out dingy laneway spaces. Well, I don't know that we all agree with the word dingy there, commenter, to hospitality folks, but aren't now offering much rental relief. Tash, do you think that's a, a fair assessment of the situation in Melbourne? This will help. Please come off mute and then we'll hear the words that you were saying. There we go. So sorry. It's okay. It's, it's not a Zoom without at least half of us going silent half the time. Please. Uh, no, I totally agree with that comment. It's... Um... At the end of the day, like we trade every day and uh, you, you're accruing a debt. And that's a really hard pill to swallow um, when you know that when, the, when everything is back to normal, uh, whatever that normal may look like, um, you're, you're going to have to pay your weekly rent plus your deferred rent uh, and any loans that are attached to any sort of money that has tried to get you through this. So, um, to be honest, I mean, I've always had the mentor. I'm not an economist, uh, you know, and I'm a, if anything, I'm a, I'm a realist and I'm, and I'm quite simple in the way that I think, but I don't think they have been impacted enough. Um, if a, a third party has come in and closed down businesses, I don't think anybody should be able to profit at that time. And if you don't have a, um, a mortgage against your property, I don't think you should be asking for rent at that time, especially when the, the revenue source has been cut, you know, cut at the knees. Uh, you know, we're, we're traveling at like between nine and eight, eight and 9% uh, in, in revenue. Like I cannot possibly pay the 50% of the rent that's being asked of me, let alone, you know, everything else that's accruing around it. So um, 
no, I don't think they've been impacted enough and more definitely needs to be done. Uh, I think it's been the biggest handball of the season, to be honest. <laughs> um, we got told, speak to your landlord. I think, we, you know, we're all trying to make our businesses survive and being told to speak to your landlord just wasn't enough. We needed somebody to back us and I don't feel like we were backed enough. I think we were cut at the knees and then told, well, do what you can. Some people have a voice, some people don't. Some people just don't know how and they don't have, they can't communicate it and they don't have the resources to get them through it. And then if you do, um, you know, look for um, some sort of legal advice, there's another money pit hole that you've just opened up. It's, it's relentless. So, yeah. We've got a, a question here from the audience that I might throw to you, Zara. Um, it's as someone who has businesses in the CBD, but also outside the CBD, uh, it's a question in, in terms of, sorry, the question I would like to know how the venues in the CBD are doing compared to C businesses outside the CBD. I think at the moment, it's a tricky question to answer because you haven't actually got any in venue trade, but what's, what's your inkling there? Um, positive light on a, on a, quite a scary one for me. Um, I'm, I do have some serious concerns about the rejuvenation of the CBD. Um, and the worker displacement question. I mean, obviously I think that's probably going to go on for some time. I think we're, yeah, we're well aware that some companies are going to see a lot of benefits from having their whole staff team work from home. Um, and that will be a model for a long time. And those offices will, will go empty for, um, for a long time, which we'll see obviously a core part of CBD trade that kind of after work drinking um, completely disappear uh, for the foreseeable. So um, look, I, I, yeah, I do worry about, the, you know, the foot, the foot traffic in the CBD is, is again, something we rely on. Lonsdale Street foot traffic is, is a heartbreaker on the corner there is um, we, we have new customers in, you know, we would have new customers in every night who were just passing by and had no clue about the bar. Um, that's not going to be the case. So I have some, I have some, um, some real concerns about, about that. I think um, like Michael said, the neighborhood, uh, the local community, the, the um, suburb, um, venues, I think, will will um, get back on their feet um, a lot quicker. I think that from the uh, response, even in delivery models, um, conversations that we've had with customers, um, people are more inclined or, or aware of their local venue in their local suburb that they need to support um, perhaps more than um, there's no real feeling of local in the CBD. And if you are a CBD resident, I think it, it's obviously a very different feeling. Um, so I think it will be a, a much bigger challenge for those city venues. The, the three of you are, are unusually well connected, I'd like to say, in terms of um, bars interstate and, and internationally. And I'm, I'm guessing you're in communication with people in, in London, in New York, hell, even in Sydney, maybe. What are you, what are you hearing about? what recovery looks like for bars in those cities. Michael, I mean, do you want to start with that one? Sure. I, I think uh, from a, a few different people in, you know, whether it's in another Australian city or uh, I had a conversation with someone in Copenhagen yesterday. And I guess- so I, fancy, Michael Bichetta. Do you say you were talking to someone in Copenhagen? <laughs> yes, a friend that I had spoken to in a while, works in hospitality, <laughs> so fancy. Uh, he's Australian. Uh, been over there for a few years and the sentiment there is that the, they're falling off a cliff as well even though they're open <laughs> so mm. I, I guess that's the scary part of, of what we're talking about here and, and what hospitality getting back on track and unlocking hospitality and, and opening especially for those venues in the city is that what are we opening into into the future what is the next yeah I mean I guess you can open the door but it doesn't mean anyone's going to walk through it no and and to relate to the what we just uh, we're chatting about with landlords as soon as the government says we're allowed to open the landlord chat is done and they won't many of them won't be uh open to any further rental abatements um because there's no government forced closure mm. and we've already seen and i'm part of uh some mediation with other venue operators um that haven't had the experience with talking to to landlords and it's heartbreaking that these landlords are very short-sighted that they're willing for this business to go out of business and then we're going into we are in a recession and they won't have a tenant at the end of it and for the foreseeable future but they're willing to take that risk 
to make this person's business be be finished. And that, that's the scary part. And then we, when we, as I said, when we do reopen, if that conversation's off the table, rent goes back up to full full whack, and we don't have even fifty percent of of revenue than what we had. Then it's, I guess, a scary uh, to me a scarier proposition to open if that's what ha- is is actually what takes place. Hash, what based on the conversations you've had with your colleagues outside the great state of Victoria, what are what are your expectations for for what? Um, recovery is going to look like our recovery yeah yeah in melbourne like what you know based on what you're hearing from overseas what what can we expect and i guess how can we prepare for that uh look at the end of the day i mean like like michael I, i've had a i tend to frequently speak to a couple of friends overseas on on in many different countries and the outcome to be honest is uh just as as bleak as ours it's it's very difficult. Um, you know, they're, they're open and they're trading, but, you know, with the limitations, uh, you know, the patronage limitations, it, you literally, they literally can't pay bills. So they, the, the bills are just accruing. So at some point, some of them are even saying they're willing to look at a number in their cash flow. And as soon as that, cash, that number is hit in their cash flow, they're done. It's, um, you know, it, it, is, it is that difficult because the... People's sentiment is still, it's still fresh and it's still scary and people are just worried about the future. I, I think the whole idea of just having, you know, money that you can easily, get, let's go for drinks and spend 70, 80, 90, hundred dollars, that's all gone. And it's, it's scary to be honest, because there's, we've, they've all put a lot of money. We've all put a lot of money, time and, uh, you know, our, our lives and our livelihoods and, and not just ours, people have built that around our businesses. So, you know, once that goes, the, the impact, the flow on effect from that is just huge, not including all the small little businesses that we deal with and, and everything else. I think, I think at some point it, you can try and go as hard as you can, but there, if there are battles put up in front of you, you can only do what you can do. You know, I, I really don't, but, and the same with us, even at Pearl, I've been quite, quite clear about that. At some point, I will have to make a decision whether we can continue or not, because I don't, I don't want to be 50 years old and lose everything we've had. Um, of course, every day is a battle. We fight every day to do the best that you can. We all do that. Nobody wants to fail. Uh, and it's not even fail, it's surviving now. But to what point do you... you do you push those boundaries and say, okay, we literally have zero money left and we've done, and we're, we've achieved nothing more than giving it a, a red hot go. You know, if, if, if the government doesn't step in and help us, uh, you know, even with, with the staff, like it's, you know, it's the hot, but the whole visa issue in my head as well. It's, it's difficult. It's really, really difficult. And that's we've got a I'm panelist. We've got a, sorry to, to interrupt you there, Tash. We've got a panelist here say, sorry, a um, commenter here saying WA trade is back at pre COVID levels. Queensland is at 50%, and New South Wales is at 40 to 50%. Um, I mean, I should say, and I, I don't, I don't want to I run the risk of sounding like a Pollyanna here, and I, I think it's certainly not true for every business, but I have spoken to some bar owners in Sydney who have said that they've had a very good couple of months. Um, you know, we do have to factor in JobKeeper there, of course. And we also have to factor in that these people are mostly owner operators who have stripped their rosters back to pretty much people who are, you know, owners of the business and are working every hour of the day. But they've, they've said that while uh, numbers through the door are, you know, nowhere near normal yield is is way up. I mean, are there some, you know, notes of sunshine in there? Notes of sunshine. What am I saying? Are there some <laughs> positive notes in there, Zara? I mean, what what? Tell me, tell me what the view is from your international network of intrigue. Um. Yeah. On the on the I guess on the interstate experiences, I have to say I don't think it should be underestimated. The experience that we've gone through down here is quite unique, um, and I think that. Uh, the confidence in, in returning and, and um, A, the, the recovery of the venues, the, the recovery that we're facing is 
far greater than what Sydney or any of the other states would have been facing when they reopened. Mm. It's, you know, we're, we're a stage further. Um, our debts are higher. You know, our, our, we've lost more staff um, over, the, over the time. Every week, I feel like we, we lose another staff member, whether they have to move back to their home city because they're not getting any financial support um, or whether their mental health puts them in a position where they um, need to go back to their parents and to stay or whatever it is. Um, it's, it's literally one a week. Um, so I think I'd start by saying, I think we are in a, uh, an incomparable situation. We've had one of the toughest lockdowns um, internationally. And I think that gets under underestimated. I was in a meeting this morning with um, a crew from Sydney and um, someone made a sort of snappy comment about, you know, let's not talk about how much sunshine and freedom we're getting because we've got Victoria on the line. Um, and they sort of went, you know, we've been through it too. We, we know, we know what it's like. We, we know where you're at. And it's, I think, um, yeah, I think more needs to be said about the fact that the trauma that we faced and the recovery that we'll face is far greater. Um, in terms of international experiences, um, I'm from the UK and I've got close contacts with um, my friends in London um, who are in a you know precarious situation themselves. I think each city has seen obviously very different experiences, but they all are um, set up or, or characterized in different ways too. So um, what works for New York hasn't worked necessarily for, um, for London. I think the outdoor dining um, operation has really been quite successful in New York. New York is um, sort of thrives off that kind of energy and, and, and hanging around outside a, a bar is, um, you know, so, certainly something that people in New York are used to doing. Um, London has had its own journey. Um, my sister lives in the Czech Republic. There's no restrictions whatsoever. Um, everyone's just kind of out doing their thing. So um, I think particularly going back to the outdoor model for Melbourne, um, that model, whilst it sounds fantastic and might be really successful in a city like Sydney, <laughs> might not be as easy here um, with, you know, less predictable weather um, uh, during the summer months, you know, there's going to be a lot more challenges. So whilst I think that the idea for that kind of initiative, like I said before, is really great, um, we really do need to think about, it's not just great because it worked for, for New York or um, because it worked in certain aspects of the UK. Um, how do we make it, how do we cater and tailor it to, to this city and how do we specifically support the businesses um, that, that need it, that need the help in, in creating those spaces? Yeah, I, and one, one note of caution that I would like to inject there is I was, uh, uh, there was an epidemiologist, uh, I think his name was Mark Lipschitz, speaking to The New Yorker, uh, and he said, the number one business you need to avoid is a bar mm -hmm. in New York in terms of, in terms of COVID exposure. Um, do you guys feel like your, your venues are, you know, pose a particular hazard in, in a pandemic? It's hard, uh, I think it's hard to say it wouldn't. They wouldn't, like our venues are all similar in terms of density, I guess, or depending on which venue you're talking about. And uh, it's something that I've been uh, worried about during when we were allowed to open briefly in stage two for, for Bar Liberty and Capitano was that if someone with COVID walked in, what that impact would have and then obviously you know, aside from the business, the health impacts, and would that be a death sentence to the business, which we've seen in um, places in Sydney, uh, especially. And uh, yeah, I think for me, it's about when we are allowed to reopen, opening safely as as possible, and not not only for our patrons, but for for our team more than anything. Yeah. I think um, I think you guys touched on. I know Zara, you touched on it a moment ago, and Tash, we've spoken about this, and the loss of staff. Uh, in lockdown is in is a particular problem, I think, in bars. I mean, Tash, you said that one of the things you'd like to see addressed um, with a great deal of urgency is the situation of um, workers on overseas visas. Yeah, definitely. How has uh, that, that had an impact on your business? Uh, so... Um... Uh, one of our one of our managers is is uh, on a four five seven visa, so um, and he's not covered by JobKeeper at all. So his salary uh, is coming out of our um, cash flow directly. Um, so it makes it quite difficult because it's um, it, for me it's very simple. You pay tax, then you should be able to claim some sort of government benefit. 
uh, or else what's, what's the point in all of it? It's, uh, I don't think we should be picking and choosing. If we took, if we removed visa holders from our industry, it would collapse. It is the backbone of our industry, whether, whether you believe it or not. Uh, I, I would struggle to find someone who is in hospitality that wouldn't think that. Um, and uh, it's, it, it needs to be looked at and it needs to be looked at immediately because it's, um, you know, I, I entered a contract with him and, you know, we're, we're responsible for him for the two years that he is here. So I could have easily, like so many other people, said, look, you've got to go home, we can't afford you. But at the end of the day, he's built his life around here based on an agreement that I, I made with him. And I couldn't think of anything worse than being told at that point, you need to go home, uh, especially after all the investment we put in him and vice versa. Mm. So, um, and you also, for us, it's like we need to, you have to maintain a certain amount of staff for the reopen. We've got two bars. We've got an upstairs bar. Um, we're currently down to five staff now from 11. So if we do open up, it will be, we'll have to pick and choose. Or it's, you know, it's, you're, you're, you're going to be working people at such a, a rate to try and, and keep everything going. But I, I think it's very difficult to do that. Like, you know, we would have to have two up and two down and one floating. It's, it, it doesn't sound viable. And it sounds... Um, or abysmal, but it's it's a big impact on, 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 on small business. Well, Australia has a massive oversupply of talented and willing hospitality staff is something that no one has said to me ever. You know, that's, yeah. that's the thing. I mean, we can't afford to lose people. We can't afford to lose people who are going home. We can't afford to lose people who are becoming disenchanted with the business. You know, I mean, the viability of our hospitality scene is um, dependent on this most crucial resource being people. Michael, I mean, I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to attend a session that you held at, at Worksmith at the end of last year where you invited your members, people the, from the Victorian hospitality community, to discuss, how is it framed? It was the, the sort of the challenges facing hospitality. And this was just to the, the bushfires were just beginning to be a bit, a bit of a thing around the periphery. COVID definitely wasn't on the map. This was back in, back in 2019. And, you know, the members of Worksmith, hospitality, lifers to a man, woman and other, um, were not diagnosing uh, an industry in the pink of health before COVID. Have any of those challenges gone away magically between now and then? No, I think they've mostly doubled down or been put on pause. And, and do, you, do you recall what those what those key challenges that your work Smith has identified at the time were for the, the health of Australian hospitality? Uh, a big one was navigating uh, industrial relations, basically, and, and how, um, I guess, yeah, number one would be staff and how to, ret how to retain great staff but then also the visa conversation came into it as well in terms of skilled workers. And then that was right at the peak of media uh, pushing out a lot of wage theft stories, a la uh, Colin Barris. Um, and there was a, a big fear around uh, understanding, are we paying our people properly? So understanding the legislation and its changes and its constant updates and ensuring that we're, we're paying people properly. But then the final major thing was a unified, united voice for hospitality. People felt that, that we weren't really represented at a, a, a political level. Uh, and I think we've seen that through COVID as well, especially when we're talking about bars specifically, where bars are, I think, left out on their own in that regard. You've got restaurant caterers, you've got AHL, AHA looking after pubs. Uh, but I think bars are... are mostly left out from a mm -hmm. national level. Who advocates for bars? You got the night nighttime industry. Yeah. Like, that they're, they're quite uh, early, early stage. Um, yeah, I, I don't think there is anyone that really focuses. You'll be looking at them, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yet, you know, plans for new restaurants and bars continue to roll on. I mean, I've, I've 
one of the actually one of the things that a few restaurant operators have flagged with me in private conversations is they're also losing uh, young, you know, sort of second tier senior management staff to the lure of vacant businesses. You know, I'm sure all of you here have staff who are being offered fantastic looking venues that are pretty much gassed up and ready to go, turnkey opportunities for just a few magic beans or just trade the house cow away a few dollars and away you go. And, you know, if you're a, a young person who's looking to open your own business and you've been working for some of the best in the trade, that can be incredibly tempting. What advice do you have, Zara Madrison, for, for people who are thinking about taking up one of these opportunities and, and opening uh, in these unprecedented times. I couldn't get through a 2020 Zoom without saying unprecedented. You'll have to forgive me. That happened. Um, what advice do I have to opening a new business in what I guess uh, I've experienced as the most challenging time in my hospitality career? Um, maybe just don't. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> Um, look, you know, uh, look, that's good advice. I mean, yeah. that may well be good <laughs> advice, you know, um, we haven't, I don't, not that I know of anyway, we haven't experienced, um, you know, anyone kind of taking that, that leap from within the business. Um, uh, I think what we've seen more so is, um, people losing their passion for this industry and being uninspired by what the industry is going to deliver on the other side of this, which mm. is incredibly sad. And yeah. that's, you know, talking to a pool of people, um, to, to some of our employees and to, uh, you know, that kind of, uh, a pool of people that are incredibly well-trained, um, incredibly capable in this industry and have had such a love for it. Um, people that have been in the industry for a really long time and have decided that, you know, they can't see a future for themselves in it anymore, even though they had pursued it as a career. So that is all, um, you know, I think it, whilst it's so hard for us to do at the moment, we have such a responsibility to, you know, try and stay strong and remain inspiring so that we can grow that industry again. And we can, um, we can, uh, re-engage those stuff and re-motivate those people to to believe in something because we, i mean we all know that we all know that the industry will recover because it has to because people love to eat and drink um and and i think i i feel pretty confident about that that you know the challenges to face are, are, are many but um but we do need to yeah somehow kind of inspire um inspire people to to stick at it and to um and to stay kind of uh, true to that love because um because we need them on the other side we've lost we've lost a ton of incredibly talented um, um capable individuals and you know we've got so many on the brink at the moment um and things like the reduction in jobkeeper that we're still set to face um in two weeks time we are absolutely uh, that will be completely a game changer for us so um, I'm just assuming that the federals are going to step in and and um, increase the JobKeeper, um, keep the JobKeeper level uh, where it is in Victoria, seeing as we've seen completely different circumstances to the rest of um, the country. If they don't and it falls down to the next um, the next level, then we've already had staff kind of wave. I can't pay my rent on that. I can't pay my rent on it. I will have to get another job. I will have to go stack shelves somewhere or you know, what have you. Um, so uh, that's, that's probably the, the scariest one for me. I think, um, well, let me pause and say, in terms of keeping the trade inspired, the three of you and, and your teams do that every day. So thank you for that. Just seeing the, the gumption that you guys have shown, let alone the innovation has been a tremendous inspiration to those of us in and out of the trade. So thank you for that. Um, I feel like we should we should draw a line under this, and I'm just going to ask you as we go around um, to close for some takeaways. Uh, what you'd like to see from the government, and I, you know, Zara, as you said, there are no magic bullets here, but there are priorities. What you'd like to see done as a priority from bars, and what you'd like to see done as a priority from the government. So. That makes sense. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Michael, what do you? What would you like to see the government do? Number number one priority. Oh, 
one. I only get one. You only get one. <laughs> Free. Uh, extension of, of JobKeeper. Uh, or keeping it the same, same amount because we're facing the same issues as, as Zara's mentioned. Uh, reducing that uh, for our staff straight away, it's going to cause some serious issues. And we've uh, had a lot more heartache in, in Victoria. So I think it, it's uh, definitely a valid <laughs> ask. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to give myself a second one and it's visa workers because it's heartbreaking. And the same as Tash, we've got a number of uh, people across the, th the three or four businesses that we're paying a job keeper amount out of, out of the business because we don't want them to go hungry. And uh, that is <coughs> only burning cash reserves. And we want to obviously keep doing it as much as possible. But there's, we've got people that have been here for five years paying five years worth of tax yet they're not allowed to get anything and it's it's pretty heartbreaking and then what about uh what you'd like to see bars doing to ensure their own survival uh i think uh you know looking at with with sarah on, on the panel here and and Everly really spearheading a lot of it with mixtape and and really being that industry leader along with tash and and, and black pearl is that we're uh obviously done a lot to to work to become uh, you know, a known bar or, or venue, but I think there can be more done from a collective perspective um, from the bar industry and coming mm. together a little bit more um, to actually get that seat at the table. And what can we do together to actually be heard and uh, not just for COVID, but ongoing because there's going to be a long rebuilding process and there inevitably we're in a, a world that, you know, we had bushfires this year. Now we've had COVID. What's next? Murder uh, wasps. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, I, I want the industry to be ready for that next thing as well. Get and that think, wasp proofing ready. Absolutely. <laughs> you know, I think about all the sweeteners and things in bars. It's expensive. No, it doesn't mean <laughs> thinking about. Yeah. Um, Tash County, number one priority for the government, state or federal, take your pick. Uh, they just. Uh, I'm going to agree with um, with what Michael said. It, it, without JobKeeper, I don't think any of us will be able to survive uh, for a, for a, a, any length of time. Um, if we had to pay our payroll, um, we would we wouldn't be able to. Not with the the money that's incoming at the moment. Um, with the with the yeah, it's just, it's just not enough. Um, so that is first and foremost, that is, that is an absolute, that has to happen and it, it cannot alter. It has to stay at that level. And secondly, it needs a cash injection and a proper cash injection. The businesses need cash injections. The whole, uh, and without strings and without so many eligibility criteria, that it, it just is phenomenal. Um, you, you know, so many people are like, oh, you can go and get the money and then you go and here, look at the criteria and it's like, well, no, 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 and no. So, no, I can't. Um, so, I think the, the press tends to um, uh, give a, a bit of a false uh, impression of how much aid there is. There is aid, providing that you're eligible for it. <laughs> so, you know, and, and that's, a lot, that's a lot of us that aren't eligible to, to get that sort of funding so hmm. what about bars tash what would you what do you think the, the most essential priority for bars themselves is right now i think we need a union <laughs> we need a proper union it's never had one as it's it's you know uh, the streets themselves brunswick street had we've been on the street 23 years but 18 as a bar and 23 years ago there was one uh, and then that just dissipated over time but um I think collectively, if we all got together and not just at a round table, because there's so many um, levels of hospitality, um, that if we had that forum where we could actually listen to each other, listen to each other's problems, and then moving forward, whether you do have a panel of people that vocalise that and take it away to where it needs to be represented, that would be undoubtedly beneficial. Like it's um, at the moment, everyone's having all these conversations independently. Um, and then nothing happens, hmm. you know? So uh, hopefully like, you know, even after today, there's different conversations that end us, end up having us sitting down and uh, using today's um, platform to get together and move forward together. Cause sometimes it's isolating. It can be an isolating industry. Uh, I know myself, I don't have a business partner to sit and talk to and, and get through those things. I do rely on our team. 
And sometimes you don't want to burden them with uh, a lot of the things that are behind the scenes because they're there to have their own role within the business. Um, so yeah, it'd be nice to see that. And I like if you're if you're listening to this and if you're not even a particularly if you're not a super famous you know incredible industry thought leader like these three, ring up ring up your neighbours in the bar world. Get in touch with some people. Give you know get in reach out on Instagram. God, I just said reach out. Oh, what a horrible thing. Sorry, drop a line to someone on Instagram who. You know, or, or maybe drop one of these guys along. Would you would you be happy to hear from from bar owners that you don't know around Victoria or and around Melbourne on the Instagram? It's just totally. Hey, right. hey. Yeah, yeah, totally. This is this is the beginning of these conversations. Um, Zara Madrison, chief priority from uh, on high from the federal government or the state government. Um, besides what's been said, which I think are probably um, at the top of my list. Um, visibility around or, or more transparency around deferred versus waived because they make a big difference um accumulating debt isn't really something that we need um waiving uh payroll tax with license really helpful um so and and that public kind of media piece often often says you know deferred or waived and, and like i say they're really really different so that transparency um, would be very welcome. Someone's in the sky right now. I don't know if you can hear that airplane. It's not good. Many it's like the one airplane flying over Victoria this yeah. week. So I think it's Tony Abbott, actually. Hmm. Could be. Great. Um, yeah. Uh, and um, the, again, transparency, like eligibility is a word that I, I just don't want to even um, think about anymore because... Um, you know what's been what's been promised or pitched or offered and what we're actually able to access is completely different um i know that our um our particular um difficulty is the fact that we um we are a group and therefore we have one payment entity that um, houses all our employees for example we haven't been seen as separate entities at all so our independent businesses haven't had any access to any of the government grants um so that has been an absolute nightmare um and and it's just it's simply a formality um that should be uh you know re-looked at and, and considered because it is game changing um so i guess they're my priorities for um for government support i think um similarly i think there's there's such uh, a need for us to unite and get a, a better, stronger voice as an industry. I think the restaurant industry is really well, um, uh, really well documented and, and advocated for, and it has been during um, this crisis particularly too. And I feel like we've really had our voice, um, uh, not had our voices heard. So that's there's a big need for that. And the other one, I guess, is um, that statewide support. I, I do feel like um, with the other states opening up um, and unfortunately australia has sort of started to each state's fending for themselves which i can understand um and we really see a local response to a lot of the stuff that we do we've got you know our, our local customers are are you know following what we're doing and and um you know they're experiencing a similar thing so i i get it i do understand it but i would like to put a call out to say you know um the other states that have run uh, pop-ups and events that have um, you know hosted some of our drinks and tried to drive revenue for Victorian bars that are closed those sort of things make all the difference um, and you know it like I said before it's 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 uh, a million different pathways rather than one one answer um, so anything that the rest of the states can do in the next few weeks while we remain closed to, to support Victorian industry I think is, is really positive. Here, here, and and thank you to anyone who's tuned in from interstate. I have I have noticed on our registration and here in comments there are quite a few people from outside Victoria. So thank you for your for your interest and for your your comments. I know that certainly for me and everyone at the festival, um, they're tremendously encouraging. So I know that if you if you've tuned in and you're in contact with anyone in Victorian hospitality, as we've touched on, the the feeling. Uh, this side of the Murray is a little bit different to the rest of the country. So we appreciate your um, care and concern. Um, that's all we've got time for today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'd like to say a big thank you to the festival's principal partner, the Bank of Melbourne, and to our destination partner, Visit Victoria. Thank you to our panellists, um, Michael Bichetta, Tash Conti, and Zara Madrusen.
thank, thank you. you. Um, thank above you. all, I'd like to say thanks to you at home for joining us. Um, I hope this has been helpful. If you've got suggestions for industry forums further down the track, hop onto our website or our socials, leave us a message. We're easy to find or, or you can message me directly. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, here at Melbourne Food and Wine Festival, we are quite busy actually, which is good. Although this being 2020, we're not busy doing the things we normally do. Um, right now we're in the middle of Negroni week, as I'm sure everyone on this panel is aware. Um, how good are Negronis? Yay. I will be right here on your computer slash phone screen, albeit on Instagram live at 5.30 this very day, drinking everyone's favorite Florentine cocktail with Carlo Grossi from Arlequin. Uh, and we'll be joining you for a Negroni every day this week at 5.30 on Instagram Live. That's Melb Food and Wine. So much going on. Gosh, we're also in the middle of season one of Celebrity Sandwich. I don't know if you guys are across this. Do you do solids? I'm not sure. But uh, on the food side of Melbourne Food and Wine, we're um, working with some of Victoria's best and most interesting chefs to make sandwiches at home. Tomorrow's episode features Tom Serafian from Bar Saracen making Kefta Arayas, which is super delicious. Uh, that'll be on the Victoria Together website. That's just the tip of the iceberg on Melbourne Food and Wine Festival at the moment. We've also got another industry forum lined up for Wednesday, the 14th of October, uh, where we speak to industry leaders around the world to look at their insights on um, how they're adapting to the wonder that is 2020. Um, if you'd like to stay on top of all of these things and more, sign up for our industry newsletter, follow our Instagram, get one of our carrier pigeons, look for our smoke signals. We are all over it. Thank you again for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Look after yourselves. Good Thank afternoon. you. Thank you. Stay up.